everyone's been muted, so. Nancy, I can see you talking, but you're muted. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm sorry. Taylor! <laughs> you guys, it's been a long time. I miss you! All right. Sorry, there's Vivian. <laughs> Hi, Deb. Kentaro. All right, we are now live. So I think everyone has probably been muted. So um, we'll have to wait and catch up later. Um, but welcome to the April 2021 Emerging Writers Reading Series. Um, my name is Amy Birch. I am a third year in the MFA program here in creative, in creative Writing and Environment here at Iowa State, and I will be your host this evening. This re month's reading is different than previous Emerging Writers events as it is presented as part of Iowa State University's Ignite Innovation Showcase. The CWE program curated an amazing day of programming as part of Interdisciplinary Innovation, Arts, Environment, and Sustainability Day. I hope you were able to enjoy the programming presented throughout the day and thank you for joining us for this live event. We have four amazing readers tonight who have put together a wonderful program for you. Uh, before I introduce our first reader, a few reminders. Um, you can have your camera on if you want, if you are, depending on how you're joining us this evening, um, but you are not required to. Um, in some cases, it might be easier if cameras are off, but again, I will leave that up to your discretion. Um, also, please feel free to use the chat function on the right side of your screen, again, depending on where you're joining us, if you're on Zoom or on YouTube. Um, readers enjoy seeing your encouragement, your support, and any lines that particularly resonate with you. So please do not hesitate to share those thoughts in the chat. And now I will introduce our first reader for the evening. Kelsey Zimmerman is a first year student in the MFA program for Creative Writing and Environment at Iowa State, where she is also pursuing a certificate in Geographic Information Systems. As a poet and essayist, she explores recurring themes of family, place, and life in the digital age. Her work has recently been published in Ghost City Review and Nurture, a literary journal, and she's currently working on a chapbook of visual erasure. erasure. So now I will hand it over to Kelsey. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to be with all of you today. Um, I really encourage you to like type in the chat, but for the record, I do not have the multitasking ability to look at the chat at the same time. So if anything goes wrong with my audio or something, please, please, please interrupt me, um, like audially. Okay. I am going to read um, three poems for you, one prose poem and one little um, CNF flash um, piece, and then I'm going to share some visual poems I've been working on. So the first poem I'm going to read is called Red Letter U-Haul Day, um, and this is the one that was just published in Ghost City Review, which I was um, very excited about. Okay, Red Letter U-Haul Day. I drove west through Michigan on I-94, past dilapidated hunter's shacks, backyards like scrapyards and one stoplight towns and wondered if I was ruining my life. I wondered about the TV swaddled in a pink blanket the dog and I shared in another history. I wondered about the heft of my books, glassware I hate, betting from a monopolistic mega corporation, white corral bowls, the inadequacies of bubble wrap. The train is better how it winds through backyards and country road crosses where a lone pickup has stopped, all accusing impatient headlight eyes. The highway is a pool for matches, and I lap, I lap, I lap, I lap, I lap. Uh, thin, and so we move on to the next one, I guess. This one, um, I'm still working on a title, but I have for right now settled on a Midwestern yearning. It took more than a year for the sickness to settle in my gut, star dense, astro fury, a bile of thick nectar rotted, longing for cider mills, bike rides along the river, effervescent golden mornings for which there is no curse. 
It's quiet here. The horizon hangs in the distance like a string waiting to be plucked. All the fields, all the emptiness. Well, I have enough compunction to fill it. I can see so far down these country roads. There parallels another disease. The next farmhouse a mile away. Windmills cutting up the sky. Um, this next one is tricky um, because in my, um, in Carissa's um, poetry is performance class, uh, one of my classmates, Zoe, who's here, actually memorized this poem and performed it. And now I'm in the awkward position of feeling like I cannot uh, perform my own poem anywhere as near as she did. Um, so I will do my best. And I also have a new title for this uh, poem, poem, which Zoe was also helpful with. Um, so the title of this is End of a Hike Gone Awry in Joshua Tree National Park 2012. The desert is thirsty for me, I know. Sand suck, gritty dune domes. Nearby Joshua Tree has turned into a man, grins then, limps off to some other heathen. I'd like to drink the sky, Lake Huron sky, the still creek and August sky, reflection on the water sky. Shortcut was a mistake, sixting a cacti gun, abscessant tongue trial, swamp dry heave. Remember that ghost flight in Greece Sky wraith, cloud mirage, pilot ghosts at the controls, passenger ghosts, merrily, merrily. It would be nice to go like that. 4.45 a.m. alarm, $40 Uber to the airport, flight attendants and Medusa slinky curls and yo-yo smile to make myself small, shrink down the aisle into my seat, to nod off into the dark, on the plane of a stranger's strong shoulder, need some fallow thing from yesterday. Um, thank you. All right, and now I'm going to transition to a couple of things that are newer and I'm feeling a little bit daring with showing them. So, or with reading them, but that's exciting. All right, this is a little prose poem called Peekaboo. A friend posted a photo of her daughter, a year old, toothy grin swinging at the park. That tar leather rubber of the diaper bucket that huddles her small legs must be warm in the early spring sun. She's a chunky baby, all the best, happiest babies are. And she's smiling right at the camera like she's smiling right at me. I see you, baby. I haven't met you yet, but I will. I try to reach through the crude pixels of my computer screen to lift you into my arms. Useless. I would ride to battle to make you smile. I would slay a thousand yellow jackets, would drive 800 miles in a beat up Corolla to dawn on you like the uncomplicated smile on your face. Beam me up, Scotty, raise me inside out, return me to sender, and when the hell of, all of this is all last season's jacket as a still life in the back of the front hall closet, I'll find you at home in a playground I rambled over when I was a child too. And we'll play peekaboo. Where'd we go, baby? Where'd we go? Um, all right, and now I'm going to read a little CNF piece. that I just wrote on Sunday. So that's, I kind of like sharing things when they're super fresh, it's fun. All right, this is tentatively called Mickey D's. For a while in my teens, I fantasized of writing a short story about someone visiting a McDonald's for the first time after being kidnapped and locked away for a year. How garish the lights inside would be, how foreign the cash wrap and the employees with their dark baseball caps, how bizarre the faux terracotta tile work modeled with old coffee stains, how senseless the soda machine, 
And today it would be the Coca-Cola freestyle boasting a hundred plus flavors. I'm not even the old kind of contraption with six flavors. And it was so traumatic when the only lemon lime option was Mountain Dew instead of Sprite or Sierra Mist. And sometimes you would push your cup against the metal lever that triggered release of the pop, but sometimes you instead had to push a button to dispense your sugary drink of choice. And either way, it came out with a clicking noise that gushed around the edges like a sunrise. Sometimes what came out would look flat and taste sickly sweet, and that meant something was wrong with the carbonation in the machine. And sometimes what came out would be too pale, crystalline fizz, and taste like bubbly water. And that meant the syrup had run out. And either way, you had to get back in line and inform an employee. Even if it was too late for you, and you had chosen another flavor or had decided water was absolutely fine, telling someone was the right thing to do making sure someone else didn't have that moment of fleshy disappointment, flaccid and immutable. Over a year into the pandemic, I haven't been back to a McDonald's. Even before this, I wasn't visiting one very frequently, mostly in airports, mostly when having a tough day and trying to self-medicate with their chocolate shakes. Now it's been well over a year since I dined in at a restaurant, but I'm vaccinated and did go properly shopping today for the first time in 14 months. I drove to Des Moines to visit a proper mall and wondered how foreign it would feel, how brash the fluorescent lights, how overpowering the scents of vanilla and jasmine flowing out of Yankee Candle and Bath and Body Works. I went inside. I worried about being the victim of a mass shooting. Tinny pop music floated in one ear and out the other. We all wore masks. It was packed. It was the same. COVID-19, these 14 months of punishing isolation and grief was something that had happened to other people in some other place. It is an anvil, this sameness. It is a crucifix, an indictment. And I guess it means that somehow for now, it has to be enough that I'm a different person. On the way home, I stopped at a Five Guys for a burger and shake. And when I went inside to pick up my order, a Coca-Cola freestyle machine stood expectant in a far lonely corner. And that's my little CNF piece. And now I'm going to share a little um, PowerPoint with you of some um, visual erasure poems I've been working on in Photoshop, which, have, which I've really enjoyed and have been really fun. And thank, thank you all. I can see a, some of the things coming up on the chat. Okay. All right, so hopefully this works. I'm going to share my screen. All right, screen two. <laughs> I saw that, Aja, that's funny. Okay. All right. All right, and I'm going to share this from the beginning. All right. Pandemic of place, the city, a far reaching dance, lifted in death. Pandemic air, poison drenched the winds, the lonely silent harbor of a country fell. The turns sigh, a red, red secret. At an owlish angle, she was proud. She was a thousand light years from dust. I only want, I want, I want, I want, I want.
I turned around, damned. And when I drove the freeway home, it was like a miracle. Forced to show its colors, the river bled away. And when it stopped, all streams everywhere quit running. I was alive for good, a huge bodiless billow. That was romance, a vaporous tilt, a smiling danger. And these are just the sources. Um, thank you so much. That's all I have for you. Thank you so much, Kelsey. One of the cool things about having the readings on Zoom has been the chance to kind of feature some of these more unique pieces like that. And of course, all of your other work was amazing as well. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, our next reader is Kintaro Kumanomito. Kintaro, born in 1990, St. Louis on ceded Osage land, is a poet or performance artist and poet. Sorry, I'm tripping over my words here. Their work is rooted in practices of embodiment, improvisation, and intuitive risk taking. They are currently a digital and environmental justice community organizer with United Congregations of Metro East and a Pearl Hogra first year fellow in creative writing and environment at Iowa State University. And with that, I will hand it over to Kintaro. Thanks, Amy. Um, thank you for going first, Kelsey. Those were incredibly beautiful pieces, um, very inspired. Um, really want to get into Photoshop now and do some of that kind of work. Um, so thanks for showing up everybody this evening. I have seven poems that I plan to read to you. And the first is called Butterfly Lights. Butterfly Lights. Before the Beltane ritual, a simple blessing, incense, LSD, and ash. Then gravity into center, sobbing, skull on rock, driving deeper into hardness, darkness, the touch of angels, so unreal, until opposing armies, orange versus blue, the gathering is over. At night, inside my tent, my pineal gland once again tries to leave my body, this time vis-a-vis -vis a plastic camping lamp repeating A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, until I say my name, say my name, into the void, catching the attention of two earthen fairies who pull me from my piss-soaked quarters. Strung out on the porch, I am looming phosphorescence, okra essence decryption. In the front room, I am writhing until a glass of water and a clonopin. Easy Tiatsui, it's easy, I see, I see. I've surrendered, dying once again, drifting, held and held. So the next piece is titled Mouth of Man. My organic unbecoming, unconscious of tensegrity, heaven swapping old neutrinos. Side note, extensionality, frailty, 
backtrack, preparedness, mycology, a glandular network of stars. The next piece is titled AZT. AZT, 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 Atsuya, Tsuya, 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 I see, 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 I see. Thank you, everyone. The next piece is called Almost a Blood Bond. And it's for Tracy. Standing on the roof of your garage with a crowbar and a hammer. I pry nails from pressure treated panels. So your cowboy pool below me, a round tin trough of water, can reflect the moon and stars at night and the yellow sun at noon. It takes me days to fully open up the rafters. But when it's done, we gather roof scraps in your truck bed and tarp them down beneath a fluttering of blue. Then take a rest until sunrise to make our journey to the landfill. We drive in mostly silence past giant stones and hills of mustard colored flowers, a radiant desert menagerie emanating hues. All righty, uh, three more pieces. Uh, this piece is titled, When I Heard Maureen Cried at Socially Distanced Brunch. This was written last fall. Most of these pieces were written uh, this previous fall and winter. When I heard Maureen cried at socially distanced brunch, I wrote that a weight of a child in this world seems unbearable for several reasons. The least being our current situation, the greatest being climate change. But in between, there's the next 100 years and I feel like planting flowers in a circle. And in the springtime, this will be a poem to all the mothers of the world and a home where friends will bring me food and things to build a shelter with. And I can't promise that I'll stay inside the circle. But the point is this, the earth is living, you are it. And life is good and keeps on going and finds a way no matter what until the world ends from an asteroid but that's not even it because in truth you're not a body you're a crystal made of stardust and the sun's a living creature and she'll take care of every crystal baby even when the earth is shot pure fantasies having been gathered Exist, bird. I'm yellow, or at least my body is. Officially, I'm white and yellow, carrying my father's essence, hybrid democracy. Spill all mammal movement sphere solutions. Inside of a crystal violet radio, America's becoming three. Echo animal sculpture, dance. Reproduction won't happen very often after 2027 due to shifts in astrological patterning. Good luck. Give all to all, 
Now resonate. Oh, oh God. Oh God of his seven sister universes, seven altars all again. The United States of America's is an intelligent holograph and theory like song. Bird finally replies, they're re recreating heavens of Crash Lord, the master, where I lead dream in 12 God, you smell vision, one image here, our, 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 our. Yellow, 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 violet. Violet yellow. And flame, and flame number like gold numbers, softer rose, hybrid of math, silver quartz, water gestures, bronze faith, hair, 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 hair. I fled my congregation, last name. Thank you, everyone. That was the first time I think I've used that voice in front of an audience, perhaps ever. <laughs> um, the last piece, Sparks in Parks. From time to time, humans erupt in strong emotion. These eruptions are akin to coronal mass ejections from the sun. Like with the sun, these eruptions contain vast amounts of information. Information that is then received by and transfigured into biochemical electromagnetic signals here on Earth. Exempli gratia. On a call with my ex, I nearly set a bush on fire. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Kentaro. Um, our next reader is Jordan Castaneda. I really hope I said that right, Jordan. <laughs> Jordan is a second year MFA student hailing from California, New Jersey, the Deep South, and most recently, the Desert Southwest, where he attended Prescott College in Central Arizona. Jordan writes poetry, short prose, and other fragmentary forms focusing on war, peace, and points between. His work has previously been published in the Albion Review. So now I will hand it over to Jordan. Hey, thanks again, Amy, for facilitating this and creating the space and for everyone who's involved in Flyway and like the whole Innovation Week thing and here to create this, um, really appreciate it. And for the, the new folks who are, for this is like our first collective meeting before next semester. So good to have all or one of you or however many there are. Um, before we get too much further, everyone can hear me, right? Okay, good. Yeah, so um, um, I've been asked to keep this safe for a general audience, and um, I intend to honor that. It is, however, there by, by means of like a content warning. There are um, it, it covers like weighty issues about state violence, and the final piece will contain um, some slurs that have been directed towards Muslims and Arab people. So, just to throw that out there. To begin this, I will start with a piece of found poetry. Um, so not my words, but something that I think really fits the whole past year of everything that's been happening. Um, it must have begun in January because uh, this is found verse for sudden tears bursting on a winter sweater, January 23rd in the year of our Lord, 2020. Today, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists moves the hand of the doomsday clock. It is 100 seconds to midnight.
that was that. Um, the next one is about a interesting document that the government produced in the 1960s when Vietnam was kind of getting kicked off. They issued a new weapon to the soldiers over there. It was the M16, which replaced the M14. Um, and it was a really rocky transition. The first generation of the M16 was kind of rushed into production. There were like issues with the propellants that they used in the ammo. Um, and long story short, a lot of GIs received these like malfunctioning weapons with scarce to little training and not the proper equipment. And a lot of them died um, because of that. But one kind of weirdly absurd comic thing that's like from this generation is that the government issued a comic book manual about this M16A1 to the troops, probably because it's just a little more digestible than military manuals usually are. And it has a lot of really interesting um, illustrations such as this. So this poem or prose piece, whatever it is, is about that document. Coaching hints for a better season with your M16A1 rifle in the Vietnam League begins one page in the U.S. Army's comic book manual that taught young men bound for war how to clean their killing tools with tender, loving care. The women take up most of the page. Bombshell, damsels, sex kitten, buxom comic book superwomen with bobbed hair and dazzling eyes and killer smiles lined in dark lipstick, their bodies curved in some mid-century Coke bottle ideal, all smooth hips and perky tits and great legs dressed in go-go boots or combat gear, wielding their own fully automatic sweet 16s and telling hell-bound zapster GI readers how to strip your baby or dispensing some number one preventative maintenance suggestions to keep you go-go. Did the boys who held this think it is as ridiculous as I do now? The dry prose and diagrams of the military manual, reincarnated in technicolor, scored in electric 60s slang, all dope and zapsters and Charlie and number one and real sweet numbers. Maybe the younger ones bought it. Maybe when they picked up this book with the pretty girls, they think that, yes, see, this here is a lot of information and there's a lot of small confusing parts to my M16A1 rifle to lose and a lot of things to do to keep it clean. But if I just do all of this, maybe I will be okay and Charlie won't get me. And if I pay, to, if I pay attention, maybe, maybe I'll get back to my own Coca-Cola bottle of Vixen and then I can strip my baby to lay her somewhere dry, gently clean, lightly lubed some comic book ending where the heroes never really die and the rifle always works and the bases are all loaded and the bat cracks and the lonely, horny, angry, sad, happy, howling, scared, proud, righteous M16A1 zapster boys all get to go back home. Big champions of the Vietnam League. Thank you. And for this piece, if you wouldn't mind lending me the screen. Um, I think Teresa might need to do that. Okay, great. Yeah, let's see if I can do this now. All right, thank you. I must have missed something. This is a visual, there's a visual aspect to this poem. It is a piece of text from just a standard like unclassified military manual about different types of drones and it incorporates um, some testimony from a family of Pakistani farmers. Um, actually the, uh, the family, uh, I think the parents were school teachers. They were also farmers because they were in rural Pakistan and they got mistakenly hit with a drone strike and they were invited to testify before Congress. Um, so it was the surviving parent and these two young children. And I believe that there were only five members of Congress in attendance at that hearing, which means that there are more people in this Zoom room than were our elected representatives to hear the consequences of our 
drone operations over the past decade. Unmanned aircraft system operations. Reproduction for non-military use of the information or illustrations contained in this publication is not permitted without specific approval of the commander. J-U-A-S-C-O-E, Creature Force Base, Indian Springs, Nevada, 89018. MQ-9 Reaper. The Reaper, figure 3.4, is a larger and more powerful derivative of the Predator. The basic equipment suite of the Reaper is similar to the Predator, and the primary mission equipment consists of a Raytheon AN-AAS-52 Victor MTS EO IR sensor turret laser designator and a general atomics AN-APY-8 Lynx SAR. The Reaper can carry and fire the AGM-114 Charlie Kilo Hellfire missile. The whole ground shook and black smoke rose up. The air smelled poisonous. Everything was dark and I could not see anything. I heard a scream. We ran, but several minutes later, the drone fired again. I was trying to wipe away the blood. My grandma was teaching me how you can tell if the okra is ready to be picked. I really liked my grandma. I enjoyed following her and learning how to do things. When the sky brightens and becomes blue, the drones return. Now I prefer cloudy days. And finally, I will finish with a longer prose piece that's divided into three sections. They will tell you that in the next period of instruction, you will learn how to lob a 203 round into a cradle full of Haji babies as a humorous opener to a lecture about indirect fires at the School of Infantry East. And you laugh with the hundred something other late teenage boys with no hair or very short hair and no sleep. And somewhere in the box of things you've kept for 10 years is a tattered textbook stapled together, corners rounded, its edges abraded with North Carolina. And on these pages are diagrams of weapons assembly and fire team formations and maneuvers on urban terrain. And drawn in a margin on one of those pages is a penciled parabola whose origin is the muzzle of a crudely drawn M203 rifle mounted grenade launcher and whose terminus is an inch to the left, near the edge of a page, on a cradle of wriggling cartoon infants wearing baby-sized turbans and wailing graphite tears. But they will not tell you what crying Haji babies sound like when you are taking away their father, who may or may not have planned to kill you, or may have been in the wrong place at the wrong time, under the wrong flag, or praying to the wrong god, or what crying haji babies sound like when they are brought swollen and raw into the clinic badly burned, or what crying haji babies sound like when they are indeed blown up, perhaps by an errant M203 round that nosed softly into the sand some months before in another young man's war, or by an Italian-made anti-personnel mine laid 30 years ago for Russian feet or whatever it is that slumbers in the ground awaiting a child's football. Footfall. They will not tell you how to cry or that for many years after you will hate hearing women or children cry because for you that particular sound will bypass normal routes of audition and make firecracker fuses of your spinal nerves where it singes and crackles radiating outwards and licks of saw bladed fire around a tightly choked chest like the way you imagined as a child it would feel to touch a bare live wire you mash your tongue up into the slippery ridges of your palate behind your incisors as hard as you can which is how you've taught yourself to stifle overwhelming and sudden urges to cry you mash your tongue whenever you hear that sound, or sometimes when you see a hijabi and her children walking in the park, or eating lunch at Chick-fil-A, or sometimes for no reason whatsoever, because it is fall, and suddenly the maiden hair on the sidewalk is so very beautiful. Two. They will not tell you that if you drink one four loco on the way to RDU and one Jack and Coke on the plane and two rums at Coke at Charlotte and another Jack Daniels mini during your second flight, that at 30,000 feet, 
in a bout of turbulence and lightning near the 23rd hour on a midsummer's red eye flight back home that when a baby somewhere in the cabin screams those saw blade cries you will go from seat 17a to your wet knees and buttocks in a ditch on the east side of a muddy field and you are shivering and you lean into your, your machine gun's buttstock to scan the tree lines for pretense of mortal threat while a veiled woman behind you screams in pre-linguistic agony as your friends flexi cuff her husband's wrist to take him away and god this is so much more real and wet and dirty and smelly and you marvel at the odor of hay and dust coating your throat and the high olfactory tickle of the morning hearth fires that perfume the treetops blue and you inhale the pungency of the damp earth impregnating your flame retardant trousers and you hear crying and it is real and you really are back in your blue polyester seat now sobbing into a plastic airplane window screen some rose behind a crying baby hoping the nice flight attendant who gave you your drinks for free doesn't notice though they will tell you how to estimate range in football fields and shoot magnetic azimuths and intimate the topography of the maps whose colors and keys you know by heart they will not tell you about the strange and speedy trails that enjoin points like a farmhouse at 41 romeo papa quebec 04578 72019 and a space in the sky somewhere above the piedmont two years and seven thousand miles and thirty thousand vertical feet later three they will not tell you how to tell these sorts of things to the girlfriend you think you'll marry so when you are you against having the children she wants with half of you and their imagined play and laughter you are a coward and you lie and you say that you don't ever want to be responsible for any new life in this messed up world full of evil people because the world is not a safe place and people are not good and neither especially are you and besides there's this thing about the sound of children and screaming she will say things and you will say things and you will say worse things and then in a month or two you will stop saying things to each other at all They will not tell you that when a roommate invites her wandering friend with lover and newborn child in tow to spend the weekend at your apartment, you will be quietly angry because you can't really relax with strangers in the house and you still don't really like crying babies, but it's her name on the lease and you don't want to be an asshole. So when you come home, you will smile anyway at your roommate and her friend spending the night, but the roommate's friends baby is on the floor crying because the father is gone down the road getting groceries and beer and so the friend mother looks a little embarrassed at the screaming and the crying and you are in the doorway but she invites you over anyway to meet her daughter if you want and so now you take a deep breath and kneel onto the soft carpet on your knees and buttocks Open your palms and gently bring the warmth of your roommate's friend's baby into your hands and across your forearms, skin to skin, look into eyes that stare transfixed at you, perhaps mistaking one bearded student for another, and you realize that this is the first child you have ever held in your adult life, that somehow in the cavalcade of unions and births and first steps in your family, you missed this. The baby calms and quiets. And when she does, so do some parts of you. And her mother lets you keep cradling her close to your chest for a while until her father comes home. And maybe, maybe you are finally starting to be done with whatever the hell they told you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Jordan. Um, also, with the mic and the headphones, can you just, in the radio voice, can you just do like an audio play or something? Like, <laughs> it's <laughs> <Yeah>. amazing. <laughs> I'll have to get something arranged. <laughs> well, thank you again. Yes, one of the comments is Jordan needs his own podcast, and I would have to agree with that. <laughs> um, our final reading this evening is a collaborative poetry project. Throughout the day today, we ask Ignite Innovation participants to, resign, to respond to writing prompts via a platform called Jamboard. Participants had until five o'clock this evening to contribute their words and a team of talented writers took those words and created something new. So now we will premiere co-writing the new world, a communal poem. 
please enjoy. Hi, all. Thank you, all readers who um, read tonight. This was stunning. Um, am I being spotlit right now? Actually, could we have, or maybe it'll bounce back between the three of us. Okay. Um, that was really amazing. All three of you are my heroes. Thank you for sharing your wonderful work. Um, yeah, as Amy said, we um, we had folks from all over to to join in on a writing a collaborative poem with us to kind of re envision the world that they wanted to see. Um, and so, like Amy said, we had a jam board with a couple guiding prompts, and folks just added their lines to the poem in sticky note form, and then we weaved it together right before this into a chorus that we will read for you now. Um, so, thank you to everyone who contributed a little piece of magic to the poem, and. Thank Thank you all for showing up tonight. Um, this will actually be featured also later this week on Ames's radio station KHOI in honor of Earth Day. Um, so thank you. And without further ado, this is Co-Writing the New World, a collaborative poem. Goodbye, soggy burritos. Goodbye, indifference. Leaf blowers deafening at the window, crushing clamp of capitalism. Goodbye, scarcity weaponizations of the soul, tying our self-worth to productivity as if we weren't good just here, just being. Goodbye time pressure. Goodbye planners, agendas, meetings. Scheduled two months before, we're done with you. Sayonara, slow, crowded silence of injustice, mis, disinformation, Vanity, individualism, greeds. Nastiest overbite. We are a new green, grinning, speckled springtime sun spilling through the branches, splashing my worshipful eyes, arms, eyes, lips. Like honeyed water. We are gratitude. We are beginning. Thank you, ancient redwoods drinking fog. Thank you, quiet snow under my feet, warm bread on my table. My children's innocent laughs. We are full up, everyone whose condition has rendered them more essential, more expendable, or more endangered in their work this past year. And thank you, life-giving trees, filling our world with oxygen. Gracias, scientists. Artists, nurses, musicians, merci. Smallest violet cluster in my front yard. Thank you, earth. Bread and friends to eat it with. The couch cushion that has reshaped itself to fit around my body. And thank you, person in front of me. Every one person reading my words, person sharing this moment with me now. Come on, reader. Come on, sister, friend, pup at my feet. One, breathe in, breathe out. One gust, gone, void, and all the rest, we take hope. Without it, our vein of gratitude gets smaller. And smaller. I find hope in my morning oatmeal steam. In Tracy K. Smith crooning through the speakers in ramps for waking up despite the cold, in the little kids laughing again outside. Hope in drawings, colored pens, and what if in children's minds. Hope in every auto response email from someone I know is overwhelmed. Take that vacation, reclaim your time. I breathe hope in comfy PJ pants. The oak trees in front of me, eons of waves collapse to foam. Still, they crash. On this winding path forward, we call in the new leaves turning over after a long winter and the purple blush of twilight stars. We call in the cradle of earth raw beneath our nude feet. The roots and fern Moss and mycelia, 
the understory surging warmth up into the so many every cherished atoms of ourselves, love. We call in the mycorrhiza, the woodpecker, my sister. Dig home for her lily in this In this new world, we call in all the past worlds that teach us the legacy of sorrows, of new found souls and great new tomorrow. We call in new beginnings. We call in everyone with the ability to make our world a better place for the next generation. We call in you, a little sweaty, a little out of breath, but full of compassion, community, collaboration, and understanding, because who knows what will come next. Thanks, y'all. Awesome. That was so cool. I was so excited to see what people would write in and how you all would put that together. And so thank you so much to Zoe, Taylor, and Vivian for sharing that with us. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. This was our final Emerging Writers event of the 2020-2021 academic year. Um, I've really enjoyed serving as your host this semester, and I hope you will join us for future CWE events. Um, as always, we appreciate your participation and support of our program. Uh, please join us for an encore viewing of the Eco Theater and Flyway Present new Eco Place happening on the Ignite Innovation platform. Um, thank you again for joining us tonight, and have a great night.